right after lunch. It's always a fun session, right? <laughs> Everyone's excited and ready to go. Um, so this is When Worlds Collide, Security and Cloud Enabled Environment. I'm Sean Metcalf. Uh, the template that I got had this great little picture here, so I thought that was really awesome, so I'm going to go with that picture. Uh, but I had my own silhouetted picture, so I figured I'd go with this instead. Um, but realistically, I think a little more animation, a little more like I'm a presenter, so we go with these. Um, I am the CTO of Trimark. I've spoken at a number of security conferences on Active Directory security, and uh, one of about 100 Microsoft certified masters in Active Directory. And I like to post interesting information on avsecurity.org. Uh, this is nice and all, but really I'm a bit of a joker and prankster. I'm the guy who wore a Venom hoodie uh, to the Spider-Man opening. And um, like I said, I am a bit of a joker, so I take that role as well. So let's get started. Um, we're going to talk about the cloud, right? That's why we're here. Uh, some security challenges with the cloud. We're going to look at Active Directory in a variety of different scenarios. Uh, some exploit scenarios, some, some cloud discovery, and auditing and logging in Office 365. What does that actually mean? How does that work? What are the limitations and what are the problems when we're expecting our logs and our, audit, uh, our auditing to be configured there? And then ultimately, what really matters? The, the security configurations and settings that, that are going to be really helpful. Some recommendations and then, and then finally a wrap up. So this is normally what we're talking about in comparing on-premises or on-prem with the cloud, right? On-prem, we do all the work ourselves, but we have all that control. We have the ability to deploy and configure network security devices and applications and agents and what have you all over our own environment. In the cloud, it's very different. We have services or we have the ability to deploy VMs in their virtual data center, right? Um, the cloud is someone else's computer. Azure is effectively Windows in the cloud, right? Um, so what does this actually mean when we're going from on-prem to cloud? So uh, Faust and Johnson had a great talk at Infiltrate 2017, and they put up this, this diagram, use it with permission, uh, where we have on-prem, we have server, and in cloud, we have services. From domain to a subscription, from a domain admin to a subscription admin. And this is very interesting. A subscription admin is the full admin, the global admin of this environment, uh, which will come into play later. We have passed the hash issues on our corporate network. Or we have credential pivoting and, and token theft and other things that are very similar in a cloud-enabled environment, because that's your proof of your identity. On-premises, we have private IPs. In the cloud, we have uh, public IPs. Well, we also have a bunch of private IPs. We won't talk about that. And then on-prem, we have RDP and SSH for management. But a lot of times in the cloud, we're talking about APIs, uh, which are often available to the internet. So that provides some very interesting situations and scenarios. So as we talk about these cloud security challenges, there's a number of things that we've got to figure out. OK, so challenges. What are we talking about? We're talking about the security controls that are available on-prem versus in the cloud environment. These are often very different. Like I mentioned, we can deploy whatever we want pretty much anywhere we want within our own environment. But in a cloud environment, we kind of get what we get. It's up to the cloud to provider to provide that for us. And then depending on which cloud provider we're actually using, there's quite a variety in what capability there is. The cloud's constantly changing. As I've put together presentations, like putting together this, together, this and, and looking and trying to do some research, the things that I've identified have changed. Microsoft's Azure documentation is totally different today than it was six months ago or a year ago. And the security capability and best practices depend on what the cloud is actually providing to us. So in AWS, in Azure, in Google, these are going to be very different environments from the perspective of what capabilities they actually surface to the end user. Some of it's going to be in a GUI format via a web page. Some of it's going to be via the, their CLI. Others you have to pay money for. Makes sense. And ultimately, sharing this data appropriately and securely is a big challenge. Um, and we'll get into that because it's a really big issue. When you have your corporate users and you need to share information with people who are not in your corporation, in your organization, how do you do that? How do you uh, share that securely? How do you ensure that the correct and appropriate people are getting access to data that is yours? But ultimately, managing these VMs is still our responsibility when we go to the cloud and put a VM up there. Um, Casey Smith had tweeted out over the summer that he found some interesting things in an Azure VM. This is not just Azure. 
Remember, when the cloud VM is instantiated for you and spun up, there are agents and other things that are running on it for the cloud provider to actually manage that system. Do you know what those are? Do you know how they work? What he's pointing out here is a privilege escalation which could be leveraged to go from a user to an admin, uh, which is an interesting scenario. So I was mentioning secu uh, sharing data securely. Uh, Kevin Belmont pointed out earlier this year that Microsoft's docs.com, people had actually shared a lot of sensitive information on docs.com and it was shared publicly to the internet. It's kind of a problem when you're talking about new hires, initial passwords, uh, documentation, contracts, uh, passwords for systems, and then the entire ticketing system. A little bit of a problem. Now, Microsoft turned off the search functionality of docs.com, which is great, but Google still it had it indexed. And so Kevin was like, hey, by the way, Microsoft has shut it down, but it's still public. So if you have something on docs.com that you don't want the world to see, you might want to double check your settings. And Microsoft sent out an email and said, hey, guess what? Docs.com, if you say publicly available, that means the internet. You might want to double check this. So not to be outdone, there's Amazon's S3 buckets. So auto lender exposing uh, loan data, wrestling fans' personal data information, sensitive data, Verizon customer, defense contractor information. Again, when we share information through a cloud provider, we have to make sure that what we're sharing is being shared at the correct level. And there was an article that said that it's human error, right? Cloud provider says, here's the capability. It's up to you to figure out how to configure this and how to share it. And Jackie pointed out that Amazon actually sent an email and said, your S3 bucket is sharing information to the internet. You might want to double check that and ensure that it's configured appropriately for what you're trying to, what, what you're sharing out, what you're giving away. And Detectify's blog uh, at this site here had a great, inf great information on about how this actually works. This S3 misconfiguration and how to fix it. So basically an attacker can identify if you have file storage uh, that is shared in and stored in AWS. There's an AWS API using the AWS command line that they can leverage to see what data is available publicly. And then from there, it's just a matter of grabbing that and keeping that data, maybe selling it. So when we go to the cloud, what's available? What can we find there? Um, how would someone from the internet be able to identify what cloud provider I'm using? Well, we start with DNS. So the first thing we can look at is DNS MX records. And so these are the email server records so that we can send email to that company or that corporation. So Office uh, 365, Google Apps, G Suite, Proofpoint, Cisco email, all of these show up in these DNS records. So I was bored one day and I decided I'd scan the DNS records for the Fortune 1000 and see what I found. And so this is some of those results. And it seems like there's a number of companies that are using Office 365, Google, makes sense. But then there's Proofpoint and Cisco email security. So these are the office, these are the cloud security apps or components that are receiving the email on behalf of the, this customer, this company, and then the data is then forwarded into the company's network, which is pretty interesting if I'm attempting a spear phishing attack or something like that because it gives me an idea of what capabilities they may have for uh, email security. And there's also text records, DNS text records. So by looking at these, I can identify what cloud provider someone is using, potentially. So Microsoft Office 365 is going to have an MS text record, Google Site Verification, uh, Amazon SES, and a number of others like Symantec MDM, if it's a Microsoft Azure website. But then some more interesting things like Paychex, DocuSign, and Lassian. Again, these are ways that this cloud service provider can prove that I own that domain. And these tend to persist for a very long time. So we can also look at SPF records. These are the email secure re security records that say email sent from this domain or this server address is actually OK to be sent for my corporate domain. And so we can get some interesting information about that as well because we can see what cloud providers a certain organization is using, like Salesforce, MailChimp, Android, et cetera. And then we get even more interesting we can start looking around to see what federation servers are out there. So I got, again, bored one day, and I decided I would start doing DNS queries for AUFS, Auth, FS, Okta, Ping, SSL, STS, and then append the domain name associated with Fortune 1000s to see what I could find. And I found a lot of different federation servers. And they showed up like this. Um, by the way, Google's DNS does not seem to care how many queries I throw at it, so that was fun. Um, 
I don't mind that at all. Uh, so looking at these and connecting to them, I was able to get the metadata from these web pages using PowerShell in a script that I wrote. And I was able to identify a number of different web servers that are running on these Federation servers. So from Microsoft to Apache to Nginx. And then looking at some of the metadata, I got some really interesting information like who's using Okta and what sort of um, aging and, and exploration is configured on these. I can also go to SSL Labs and get some information about these certificates. Because again, these are web servers. They're providing information and they have SSL search installed on them. And so in the certificate information, I can see information such as the encryption protocol, like TLS versions. Uh, it looks like it got cut off, but TLS 1.3 is not enabled on this. But TLS, TLS 1, 1.1, and 1.2 are enabled. And if there's some sort of security issue with this version of TLS or SSL that is configured on this federation server, that could be very interesting for an attacker to see how I could go after that federation server and what sort of access I could get to it. So when we're talking about cloud stuff, um, there's the GUI, but there's also the command line. And Amazon AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, Office 365, all of them base PowerShell. So there's PowerShell command lines and, and modules available for each of these platforms. And Azure actually has a cloud shell now, which we can use within the actual web browser, which is very cool. And it's Bash or it's PowerShell. And what Microsoft does is they spin up a new VM just for this in your instance, in your tenant instance, in order to run that. And when you close out that web shell, it shuts it down. Uh, so pretty cool. But we can use a lot of these uh, commandlets and, and modules if we're an attacker, if we're interested in the environment, if we are able to get a user account that is, or get onto a system that has these modules in the environment, uh, we can start doing some recon in this environment. And so here we have InGen, uh, with John Arnold as the uh, contact, and then the number of groups that are in their uh, Azure AD environment, and then additional domains that may be configured or managed in this environment as well. So from Active Directory on-prem, we have Azure AD, which we'll talk about in a minute. So we don't have LDAP, but we do have a REST API, or the Graft API. And Microsoft has this website here, uh, the Microsoft Graft Explorer. And if you have an account to this environment, you can use this to get information and run queries on that environment to see what you can find. Uh, but I found this PowerShell uh, module here, uh, PSMS Graph, which leverages that Graph API and can effectively interact with it and get data from Azure AD. Um, so still working on that, but it looks pretty cool. So let's talk about identity management in the cloud and, and what this actually looks like. Okay. Um, yeah. On that last point, um, from what you have played with it, does it look like you've got as much authenticated user openness as regular AD or no? From what I've seen so far, yes. But I haven't played with it enough to really have that up here. So good question. Uh, the question was, have I seen that Azure AD provides the same sort of data as what regular AD does to an authenticated user? And from what I've seen so far, the answer is yes. Um, all right, so identity management in the cloud. So let's look at Active Directory and the different types of Active Directory. Um, we have our on-premises AD, which everyone here is familiar with. We've got authentication like Kerberos, NTLM, LDAP, Group Policy, provides authentication, directory, management services. Then we have this new like Azure AD thing that is very weird, right? Uh, it's about 60 to 70% of the same code from standard AD, but it's primarily built around multi-tenant and identity. Uh, cloud, web-focused, and supports the standard web uh, authentication protocols. And again, there's this REST API thing, this AD Graph API, so there's no LDAP interaction with it. So when we're looking at Active Directory in the cloud, there's some really interesting things that we find. Uh, well, AD provides single sign-on for cloud services when we configure that in our environment, either through ADFS or through some other mechanism. But there's some directory sync tools that synchronize all users and all attributes for their cloud service. And what's really interesting about this is it's AD, so they just need regular user rights. So it can, with regular user rights, slope up all this information and send it up to this cloud provider. And many organizations aren't aware of everything that's actually using cloud in, in their organization. So I know of at least one customer where they were going through a password reset for all their service accounts that hadn't had their password set in a while. And they went through and forced a password change on this one service account that they didn't know what it was. And it turned out that a business unit had created this account and was using it to synchronize all of the user uh, accounts and attributes with a cloud service. And IT and security didn't even know about that. 
So Azure AD Connect is obviously the Microsoft component for your synchronizing data from your local AD to your Azure AD. And it has a number of features, and I'm not going to go through all these. But there's a couple of interesting ones. Uh, we can filter what actually gets sent. Uh, there's the ability to pa synchronize the password. So this is take a hash of that AD pa password hash and send that on up to Azure AD. So that way, users can authenticate to Azure AD. There's also write back functionality so that users can manage their own passwords in Azure AD and have it sent back to regular on-prem AD. Uh, and then some additional features that have been added in as well. So what's interesting about this is there's an Express button for Azure AD Connect. And when we click on Express, which most organizations do, because who wants to mess around with ACLs, uh, we get this first item up here, replicate directory changes and replicate directory changes all. And this is used for password sync. Well, that's a fascinating thing. So how many people here that use AD, uh, Azure AD Connect uh, actually enable password sync? OK, fair enough. And I'm guessing that there's a whole lot more people here that use Azure AD Connect. Let's see. Yeah. Did you click the Express button or did you click Custom? Custom. Custom. Thank you. That's the right answer. Because if you accept these rights and you're not doing password sync, there's this interesting Minicats function called DC Sync. And with those rights to be able to synchronize the password, as long as I have those rights, I can run Minicats with DC Sync and I can run it from an executable or I can run it from PowerShell, or now I can run it from JavaScript. Very interesting, this movie, Cats. And I can request the password hash for any account I want in the Active Directory domain. So the default administrator, the curve TGT hash, whatever I want, if I have those rights. So we click Custom, and we don't select Password Sync if we're not actually going to be doing password syncing. Or we do select it, and we make sure that we really protect our Azure AD Connect account and server. Well, that makes sense. But it's not just Azure AD and AD, AD on-prem, right? Microsoft has their own Azure AD domain services. So this is actually Active Directory in the cloud, managed by Microsoft. Effectively, AD is a service. So custom names, domain joint support, integrated with AD, uh, Azure AD. Uh, you get NTLM and Kerberos auth. You get group policy. You can do all that stuff. Your standard AD management tools. and you're not a domain admin. You're not an enterprise admin. You are this new AAD DC administrators group. So you're an AAD DC admin, which is a mouthful. And it looks just like this. It doesn't look that much different, except instead of having the scope of everything, now we just have the scope of our AAD, AAD DC stuff. But there's some limitations to this. So Microsoft decided no scheme updates, so that means no LAPS, no local admin password solution, so you can't do LAPS in that environment. No LDAP rights, which is interesting to me. Uh, no trusts. Um, no domain controller direct access. Uh, you can't modify the domain or, or domain controller group policies, which makes sense. But there is federation capability through Azure AD. And you can do password syncing from your on-prem AD through Azure AD Connect over to this Azure AD domain services. So what does that look like? It's this request from the Azure AD Connect server, and it does this every few minutes. It requests passwords for users that, have been, uh, that are in scope. And that data is sent to the Azure AD Connect server. Azure AD Connect does a bunch of things, effectively taking that MB4, adding a salt, doing PBKDF2 plus HMAC SHA-256 and takes that data, sends it up to Azure AD. And then when a user logs on to Azure AD, it goes through that same process to develop that hash to figure out if they match. So not to be outdone, Amazon has their Active Directory. And as you can see here, there's a lot of built-in delegation. So in the Microsoft Azure AD domain services, we have our Azure AD, AAD, DC, DC administrators, right? Here we have AWS delegated, and there's a bunch of things that are already delegated. Now, I could walk through all the features of Amazon, but why don't I just compare them, because that's what you're wondering anyway, right? Um, both are running 2012 R2, domain functional level and, and force functional level. And the goals of each of these are a bit different. So Amazon AWS Directory with Active Directory is designed for the cloud and corporate workloads. So that means you could actually make this a resource forest. AWS really wants to be an extension of your data center. So you could have a uh, resource for a scenario through the trust where you, you leverage this 
as a resource for us. Stand up your application, put that in AWS. You can do schema updates through an LDAF, LDAF import, which is new. They didn't have that last year. Um, Microsoft doesn't support trust, doesn't support schema updates. So it's a little bit different of a, of a design and goal there. Um, in Amazon, you can spin up additional domain controllers in different geographic locations. Microsoft focuses on those, simply those two, and that's it in that, in that one single virtual network. Um, Amazon doesn't do the password sync, which Microsoft does through Azure AD Connect. Uh, but Amazon's focus is making this another Active Directory environment that you could use in production and connect to your production environment. Amazon has added fine-grained password policies so that way you can manage password policies in the environment set up the delegation for that. And uh, Microsoft has integration with Azure AD. Uh, interesting thing about Amazon AWS is that when you're creating a new, ins uh, new VM instance from the GUI, you can select your Active Directory domain and you can select your IAM role. And when you click Create and it spins up that VM, it's automatically joined to that directory, which is very cool. The only problem and the problem that I had with it was it took me about six hours to join a VM to Amazon's directory. Now, I'm an MCM and Active Directory. I should know how to join a, a system to AD. I think it's the first question on the test. Um, but I couldn't do this. And I read through probably five or six different documents that Amazon had published on how to do this. And on one of them, it actually says to join your VM to uh, Amazon's Active Directory, you select the directory, you choose your IAM role, and then you click Finish. Problem is, there's no IAM role there to select. You have to create it yourself. And none of the documentation actually explained how to do this. So I have to re reach out to Amazon support. So they're still working on that. Um, but very cool because it looked like Amazon had put a lot of work into the AD component itself, especially with the delegation. The cost is about the same, the real difference. This 280 a month that you're seeing on the bottom here under Amazon, this is when you go for the uh, Enterprise Edition. Um, the standard edition includes uh, a gig of directory object storage and uh, supports up to 5,000 users or 30,000 directory objects. The enterprise one includes 17 gigs of directory object storage and supports up to 100,000 users or 500,000 objects. So that's where that bigger number comes from. But they're, they're price competitive. Isn't it the basic edition? Uh, yeah, I didn't include that. The, the basic, like the, the basic, I think free one effectively is Samba and that's I think just a few thousand users. Um, but that is an option. It uh, has, a, has a bunch of features, actually more features than I thought it would for, for uh, what, they were, what they were offering. So let's look at some exploit scenarios. <laughs> <laughs> ah, some people are paying attention. Very good. Uh, how can we gather email content from Office 365 if we have a valid user account? So we're, we're putting on the, the role of the attacker, putting on the hat, the attacker hat, that role. So there's this PowerShell tool called MailSniper, which can connect to an on-prem exchange or Office 365 environment to pull data from mailboxes. And this is what it looks like. We run it, it prompts for a user account. So we use a user account, either an admin or the actual user's information. And then we can connect to the mailbox of our choosing. And it's gonna go through and connect to that mailbox, um, either through the on-prem environment, here it's Office 365, and what's interesting about it is it's searching the mailbox automatically for terms, password, creds, and credentials. And then it'll provide data on what those emails are. I could, I could do more than this though. I could pull all the email if I wanted to. This is one of the reasons why it's very important to protect uh, users' identity and their passwords and making sure that they're using good passwords <coughs> in their environment, preferably MFA. So another interesting scenario is cloud password resetability with Whiteback enabled. So this is where we have our cloud admin uh, has the ability to change the password for our users in the cloud and reset them. Well, let's say that account gets compromised because we don't have MFA enabled and that, that user's information got, got compromised somehow. Well, the Azure AD Connect Whiteback is enabled so these passwords can be updated in the cloud and then they get written back to the corporate network. And when that happens, the attacker now owns accounts on premises, which are members of security groups and have more access than what they do in the cloud. So it's certainly something to consider when you're looking at right back functionality so that users can change their passwords in the cloud. And then of course probably the biggest issue is what if we compromise a single account? Well, what account am I talking about? Global admin. And the issue here is that this is typically the user's email address who signs up for the service. So accounting or finance, Someone who's usually not very technical, usually a user. 
and tends to retain this access. So this means that someone who's not technical, not in IT, not in security, typically has full cloud ownership to this environment. And everyone wants global admin because it's just the cloud, right? It's domain admin in the cloud world, so everyone should have it. You get cloud admin, you get cloud admin, you get cloud admin. Before you know it, you have 50 cloud admins. So all that needs to be done is ownership of one of those accounts on the cloud services. Because the cloud services is where the data is moving to. And the attackers know this and they're going after it. So the other fun one is what if we could compromise the Azure AD Connect server? Maybe it's not protected at the same level as domain controllers. Maybe it's managed by a different group. Maybe it's the same local admin password as every other server. So if we gain access to this Azure AD Connect account or server, like the service account or the server, and the express permissions are enabled or password sync is enabled, which provides the DC, DC sync capability, which I mentioned. And if this is enabled, all the synced user passwords pass through the Azure AD Connect server. So that means that it's possible for an attacker to actually get this data, pull the passwords for all the users that have this enabled, or compromise that account that has the ability to synchronize that password and then run DC sync. So you definitely want to protect your Azure AD uh, Connect server. So let's talk about Office 365 auditing and logging. This is a very interesting and challenging um, component because, again, on premises we know what event auditing looks like. We can configure Windows auditing all day long. We can do it through group policy. But what does it look like in Office 365? How do we do that? Well, Microsoft has some good documentation on their Office 365 Security and Compliance Center, and there's a bunch of different things here that, that are going to get logged. Fun fact, though, these aren't logged by default. So we have to actually click on start recording user and admin activity on the audit log search. And Microsoft says, no, nope, we are in the process of turning on auditing by default. Until then, you can turn it on as previously described. So if we haven't done that, that means we don't have any auditing of this information. And it gets even more interesting because right here at the bottom it says, if you assign a user to view only audit logs or audit logs role on the permissions page, OK, that sounds good. Um, they won't be able to search the Office 365 audit log. Really? You have to assign the permissions in Exchange Online. This is because the underlying command to use to search the audit log is an Exchange Online command. So Microsoft's got some work to, to kind of tie this together a little bit better. Because this is a little annoying. Um, the good thing is that you can use the Office 365 audit log data API to pull this data into your SIM on premises so that way you can crunch this information on your own. These are all straight out of the Microsoft documentations, uh, documentation on, on this information. So how do we do this? We can enable Office 365 auditing through a PowerShell command. Uh, we connect to the Exchange session. We import it. And then we run set admin audit log config. We make sure it's enabled. And bam, it's done. OK, not too difficult. We got all our auditing, right? We're good. No, 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 we're not. We're not good because. We have user activity in SharePoint and OneDrive for Business. We have admin activity in SharePoint. We have admin activity in Azure AD, admin activity in Exchange Online, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But user activity in Exchange Online, mailbox audit logging, must first be turned on for each user mailbox, every single user mailbox. And it's not done by default. And there's no good way to do this. I don't know. And even Microsoft says it again up here. By default, mailbox auditing in Office 365 isn't turned on. It would need to be turned on for each mailbox before mailbox activity would be logged. And then it tells you all the stuff that it could do if it was turned on. So let's look at these audit options, because uh, this gets a little confusing. We have auditing types, admin, delegate, owner. We can enable standard auditing on these mailboxes, so that way we get mailbox access to certain admin and delegate actions. And any administrator with full access permissions to a user's mailbox is considered a delegate user, so we get that also. Um, so we enable mailbox owner auditing as well, because that will give us additional information about what the owner of the mailbox is actually doing. Um, these auditing logs are kept for 90 days, so that's good. And an admin mailbox access scenario would be mailbox search or using the Exchange Server Mappy Editor. So what actually gets logged when we set these up? Well. By default, when we enable this mailbox auditing, we get all of the things that are in italics here under admin and delegate, which are pretty good. That's about what we want. 
Um, I've adapted a table from Microsoft's documentation to make it a little easier and clearer to see what, what actually gets logged. Then we have to, um, if we want to get owner information or owner data, we have to configure these individually. So things like hard delete, mailbox login, soft delete, those are kind of things that we would want to look at. So we can do this through the PowerShell, uh, PowerShell module or PowerShell session to exchange. And we can set this mailbox auditing and enable that. So here we're going to enable it, which will give us our admin and delegate access information. And then we're going to enable uh, owner auditing for mailbox login, hard delete, and soft delete. Basically, who's logging into their mailbox? And then are they trying to purge any sort of data that's in there? Could be interesting. So we enable that. We see it. OK, that looks good. But we'd also like to be able to see uh, and confirm that it's actually configured. And so we can do that with this command, which gives us um, the audit uh, log age limit, which is 90 days. Auditing is enabled. And then any additional auditing is configured on there. Now, Azure AD has its own audit logging, um, which is for user activity. And we can see that in, in the logging um, component here. There's nothing that we need to do. It's, it's configured. And Azure AD is also going to give some information about risky or unusual logons. And I apologize, it's a little small, but it says uh, risk level is medium, sign in from unfamiliar location. So this flag, when I logged in from here, or when I log in from San Francisco, or somewhere else from where I normally work or operate. And then the other thing you really want to do is monitor app registrations. Because when you register an app to your environment, that app gets certain rights, much like when you install an app on your phone. It gets certain rights in that environment. And you want to see what these rights are and how things are configured. Here we can see Azure AD Domain Services Sync is set up. And so that may be something that is understood, known, Expect it? Maybe not. OK, but like, what really matters when we're talking about security in Office 365 and Azure? Um, does it matter that we put up a gate and we just have bushes around? <coughs> Actually, there's not just one gate, but there's two. There's one over here also. So this is doubly secure. So we've got two gates. They could even put a, a lock on there. I think there's a lock right there. So it's a good thing it's locked. So we can limit the access. We can go to Azure AD, and we can configure these user settings. And this changes the way that the default is configured. Microsoft likes to provide capability to everyone, and then you kind of have to back off of that and, and walk it down. So here are the default configurations right here in the, in the lovely uh, light blue. Um, and then over here in the purple are the ones that I've configured and selected as other options, other things to consider when you're looking at these. So we have. Enterprise application control, users can consent to apps accessing company data on their behalf. By default, this is yes. Maybe you want this set to no. Um, users can add gallery apps to their access panel. Set to no, that's fine. Uh, app registrations, user can register applications. Set to yes, maybe you don't want that. Um, and then for external user access, I'm going to go through this on the next page. Because let's look at what these are. So admins and users in the guest inviter role can invite guests. This is defaulting to yes. Seems like a reasonable thing to configure. Guests can invite other guests to SharePoint sites or Azure resources. Um, this is defaulted to yes. You may want to consider if you want to set this to no. Guest user permissions are limited, so can't enumerate users, can't enumerate directory resources, or be a member in admin roles. Um, this is set to yes by default. We want that as yes probably don't want someone outside of a corporate environment or corporate boundary to be able to be an admin or operate as a regular user within our environment without having a real user account. Uh, members can invite guests to collaborate. Uh, so SharePoint sites or Azure resources. So we set this to no. Um, this means that only administrators could invite guests. Again, determine in your environment if that makes sense or not. And then this last one's pretty interesting. Restrict access to the Azure AD administration portal. So if we configure this and change the default from yes to no, um, I'm sorry, if we, if we change the default to no, yes, because it's restrict access. So by default, we do not restrict the access to the Azure AD admin portal. So this means that non-admins can use the AD ad, uh, admin portal to access AD resources. They have permissions to read and manage resources they own. Um, if you set this to yes, it restricts all non-administrators from accessing Azure AD data. I'm sorry, yes, question. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, and we're wrestling with this with Microsoft right now, is that the guest inviter role, 
so you can you know, add a, a B2B user as a guest to your tenant. And then the best, the guest inviter role, you can elevate you know, a, a guest user to the guest inviter role. But when you have done that, the guest the, that user can see and enumerate other users in your tenant, uh, which is a real problem right now. That's, that's a great point. So basically, um, the guest inviter role, inviting guests, and the access that they have from it. Right, because we, you know, we've been doing work in sort of a B2B, sort of B2C uh, mm -hmm. example of where we have a customer, a company come in uh, to use a, customer, a, a customer's apps. And then so they elevate some of the delegated admin for that company. And now that delegated admin can, for example, see all the users in my company or other companies that come in. And, and that is a problem. So uh, Sean pointed out a great, a great issue is that a lot of times we have the information from the cloud provider, but what are the unintended consequences behind that? We only know what they've told us is configured, and we need people to poke at it to, to identify what it is. I think there was another question? Uh, yes. That was just a comment. I don't know if you're aware of it later. Uh, there are additional controls over uh, guest accounts, so I'm going to go only on the Okay. So, uh, you can control, like, by default, all the guests have access to all Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the comment is there's additional controls from the PowerShell commandlets that aren't in the GUI. So that's a great point. I haven't explored all of those, so thank you. I'll, I'll take a look. Um, so an important note on this last one is that even if you restrict this access to the Azure AD admin portal, um, it doesn't restrict PowerShell or Visual Studio. So that's something to consider also. So what is one of the most important controls we can do with our cloud environment, um, our user accounts, is enable MFA. So this multi-factor authentication to ensure that even if their password gets compromised, uh, that there's some other control that can protect this account. And we can go through the GUI and uh, we can select all of them or specific users and then click enable multi-factor auth. Or we can do it through PowerShell, which I would prefer because I have more control over it. We can here, if we have user principal name, if, if there's something in there that says admin, then we can hit all admins at once and say you have to use MFA. One point on the previous slide is that Microsoft actually provides this nice uh, quick link here for MFA setup for the users, which is really helpful. Because I don't know if you've dug through the Azure portal or the Office 365 portal, but things are very difficult to find. Um, and it's, it's getting better, certainly better than, than what it was, but it's, it's still a bit of a challenge to find things in it. So administration, who has admin rights? Well, we can get a list of all the roles here. That's nice, but what do they do and what do they actually mean? Uh, Microsoft has this documented uh, through this table somewhat to let you know that the Office 365 admin, what rights they have on the different services. So this is just a, an excerpt of that uh, to get an idea of what sort of rights are, are out there. And there's more documentation behind this. I, I'm not going to throw all of it up here. Um, but who are a member of our, who, who do we have as members of these roles? And what are they actually doing? So one way to get this information is, is with a short PowerShell script just to get the information about the roles. So we get the MSOL roles uh, using the MS Online PowerShell module. And then from that, we can loop through each one and get the information about who's in there. And we can see that there's two company administrators configured. We have uh, directory readers set. There's an Azure AD domain services sync. That may be expected, it may be not. So in the Azure AD world, we have these service principles that are configured as well that have additional rights, like Microsoft Azure that sync fabric. So if we have additional integrations, if we have additional apps that are installed, there's going to be a number of these that are going to show up here. And again, it's something to monitor and check to make sure that this is expected um, and appropriate. So one of the things that Microsoft's done is they've added a new capability called Azure AD Privileged Identity uh, Management. And if you were at John's, John's session yesterday, he covered quite a bit of this. It's in preview. Uh, it requires Azure AD Premium 2. Um, but this provides workflow where you can set a, an admin group or admin role within in, um, Azure AD. And it has, in order for someone to place themselves into that uh, role or that group, it has to go through a workflow process. And so this workflow process could be auto-approved auto or it could be something where uh, it goes out to a list of people, to uh, users, and then they have to go through and accept it. Uh, and if they don't, then of course that user's not going to have that right. The nice thing about this is you can get to a point where these roles are generally empty instead of the opposite, which is generally full. And then their access expires after a period of time, which you can set through the console. 
So setting it up is pretty easy. We just click, click, and it's done. We have it set up. And we get this nice dashboard like we do with a lot of things. And we have eligible role assignments. There's nothing been configured for this. And then we have the uh, active ones that are permanently assigned. This is the default. And then when we configure one, so this one I'm configuring the um, global administrator, I can set the activation time. So this is an hour. So that means after this is approved, then this user has an hour of access within this role in order to do what they want to do. Um, we enable notifications because I want to make sure that people know when we have a new uh, global admin coming in. Uh, we can set a ticket inf information. But you'll notice that the multi-factor authentication uh, switch here is enabled, and we can't change that. So for certain high-privileged uh, roles that are in Active Directory, uh, Azure AD, uh, excuse me, MFA is required through this. And so again, we can require approval, which we are, and we've added a, a selected approver here. And then uh, the, the admin wants to go into that role to do something. So they go through and they request the activation. They click activate. Uh, they have a reason for role activation in here. And then the, one of the approvers actually get an email. And because we like having users click on links in email, there's a link here to go to the portal. And we go to the portal and we can approve or deny this request. And then once we approve it, this user uh, is, is able to uh, operate with these rights for that hour. So that's a nice feature that Microsoft has. And there's some other things that they've added as well to help improve the security of Office 365 and, and Azure AD. So one that's really interesting is Secure Score, uh, which I think is relatively new. Um, this is a, a capability where Microsoft has identified the, the top issues, security issues that they've seen across. And you go through and you can um, click through each of these in order to improve your score. Now, secure score is pretty arbitrary. I found it pretty interesting that they used out of 364, Really? Not 365? It's right there. Um, it starts at zero. Yes, thank you. The developer in the room, nice. Um, so by default, you start with about 25 out of 364. And there's these really nice, helpful items here that you can expand. So the top one is enable MFA for all global admins, so that way you can better improve the security of your environment. There's some that are not scored because Microsoft just knows that this isn't going to work everywhere and they don't want to impede your score. Yes? So does access to that require any, I don't know, like Azure premium or anything like that? Or just, no, no. no. Thank you, audience, because I, was, I wasn't certain 100%, because that's a great question. A lot of these features it require additional money, and it's not that easy to figure out what requires what. I do have a slide later on um, where I cover as much as possible as far as what, what requires extra money. Um, so we have this nice thing, this, this, this drop down. We have a category, um, but probably my favorite is user impact, low or moderate, or implementation cost, low or moderate. So that way we can focus and hit knock out the ones that are probably easier. Uh, and these are just good security practices in general. And so I pulled one out of here because I thought it was interesting that Microsoft had it. Enable client rules forwarding block, which is pretty interesting because this will prevent any user from create a client rule that forwards their email to a non-company owned email address or mailbox. Makes sense to me. Okay, so Microsoft, I've go through and configure all this. That sounds complicated. No, we just click this button down here that says apply. And after we click that a button, that button, after a certain amount of time, it's done. So a lot of these are things that you just click the button, say apply, and a number of them you have to actually go through some sort of steps like enabling MFA. But it's nice to have that capability just built into the system as well. So one of the premium features has to do with uh, identity protection. And again, John covered this information yesterday. Uh, requires Azure AD Premium P2. Um, but the nice thing about this is it provides an extra layer of protection of the identities in Azure AD. Uh, it looks for weak passwords when users are changing their password. So I have a bunch of passwords that I typically will use in my environment, my lab environment, my test environment. And I use it on one account, and I try to change uh, one of the passwords to that. And Azure AD Identity Protection said, nope, no, that's a weak password. We've seen that before. Use something different. Like, oh, I've got to come up with a new one, really? I'm going to have to remember. Um, but there are automated responses that are configured for unusual uh, login activity. So it's, if it sees that someone is logging on in a lot of different places or there's some unusual activity, some activity that they haven't seen from this user before, one of the things that can be done is it can force MFA for this login where normally it doesn't. Um, or it can actually change the user's password, force them to go through a company administrator to have that password change. 
So it can be very helpful. And of course, you get a dashboard. Uh, so that way you can see what's going on, some risk events, uh, as well as any kind of vulner uh, vulnerabilities like at the bottom, uh, two users without multi-factor authentication registration. So something that Microsoft is saying here is basically have your users enroll in MFA even if you don't require it full time. So that way something like identity protection can at least require it when it sees some unusual activity and it thinks maybe we need to prove that this user is who they say they are. So um, I have this slide because at the bottom uh, we have alerts such as leak credentials, impossible travel to, travel to atypical locations, uh, sign-ins from anonymous IP addresses, and way at the bottom, sign-ins from IP addresses with suspicious activity. So Microsoft's using all of their threat intelligence that's fed in from all their different services and providers to identify IP addresses that are known bad or known unusual. So Microsoft has another um, component called the Azure Security Center, and I'm not going to read this, but effectively this is what they're trying to um, set up and establish as kind of their cloud sim. So this security center in Azure where they can put in all this information, kind of track it, look at it there, and provide and surface this information so that it's easier to find and work with. And so we get a nice dashboard. Um, there's recommendations, security solutions, incidents. We can see the events that are flowing in. Um, pretty nice setup. And the Azure Security Center has two different tiers. There's free, which gives you some basic stuff. And then there's the standard tier, uh, which provides hybrid security. So you can actually have workloads that are sending data from on-premise or other cloud environments, not just the Microsoft Azure cloud. Uh, advanced threat detections, whitelisting controls, which are pretty cool. Uh, Just-in-time access to Azure VMs. So when you spin up a VM, it has a public IP address. And RDP is enabled. So that means anyone on the internet can hit it and attempt to log in as it which is not desirable. Um, with Security Center and Standard Tier, we can actually configure this just-in-time access where, by default, no RDP or other management access like uh, WinRM PowerShell is available from the internet. And when we go into Security Center and click on it, then it's opened up for a period of time, usually three hours. Then we can access it, we can manage it, and then it turns off automatically. And look, you get free for 60 days, just to get you hooked, right? Um, but there's configurable security policies. The agent is using 443. It's looking at event tracing as well as the event log data, flowing that into the security center. Um, and then there's recommendations which have actions associated with them. And then there's integration from other elements like the identity protection. And so uh, I have this slide because of the top four, the, the key components that you get with the standard tier where you're paying, uh, what, like $15 a month per node. Um, but the just-in-time VM access and adaptive application controls. Uh, the recommendations, are these are the ones that show up when you enable standard tier because there's additional capability. Uh, so an endpoint protection is not installed on uh, Azure VMs. Apply just-in-time network access control, which is in preview. Disk encryption, security contact details, some other information that pop up. Again, this is just a test environment. So it's not that interesting from a security perspective. Uh, I've configured identity protection. I've integrated that in the security center just by enabling it and checking a box. It's pretty easy to do, so that means that the identity protection data flows in the security center and also uh, provides additional insight into what's going on. So the application controls are pretty interesting because when we enable this, what it does is it runs through and monitors applications that are executing on our VMs and will uh, provide some recommendations surrounding that. And these recommendations, when we apply them, actually um, are the, the whitelisting controls that are placed on that VM. Um, and my favorite is identity and access. So I have a VM that I've been running. I usually have it turn off automatically. I left it on for the past few days. And within 24 hours, there were over 2,000 attempts using, uh, logon attempts using administrator, ADM test, admin, scan, et cetera. So definitely just-in-time VM access would help with that if I can't just shut it down. Or I can set up my own network security group to control uh, who has access to that. Just-in-time VM access configuration, like I said, these are the management uh, ports that are available. I can add my own custom ones if I have that set up for them. Um, I can also tweak this uh, to my heart's content. And then there's Azure Log Analytics, which interacts with Security Center. I haven't played with with this too much because I don't have really many events, but it looks like Microsoft's attempt to do more of Sim-like or Splunk-like uh, queries within this, this data that's flowing into Security Center. 
Then there's cloud app security. This is another dashboard component that Microsoft has. Uh, what's cool about this is you can discover cloud app use. So you're going to take a PCAP, upload it to the system. It's going to parse through and identify what cloud applications are being used. Uh, so there's a number of different things that it's, it's doing. Um, this is how you do the cloud discovery. Like I said, upload it. You can anonymize some of the private information. And then we'll parse it, do some data anal analysis on it, and then surface this information into a dashboard. Um, as much as I like all of this, the thing that is most confusing to me is that there's all these different dashboards. And figuring out which dashboards are really the ones you want to look at or focus on or who wants to focus on it is probably the most confusing right now to me. Um, there's activity logs that show up here which seem to span most of what's going on in Office 365. Um, so, so security and compliance center, cloud app security, trying to figure out what exactly makes the most sense. Um, we can create a custom one, and I'm going to roll through uh, SharePoint controls very quickly. Uh, you can control based on managed or unmanaged devices, apps that don't use modern authentication. Um, you can also control based on network location. And these controls get more granular as you click on each of these items, which expands out to other ones. All the slides will be available on AESecurity.org sometime today or tomorrow, so you'll be able to have these. And um, this is what I pretty much covered. The Azure Security Center, the Office 365 Cloud Security app, Office 365 Secure Score, conditional access, uh, which I haven't covered, um, but it's still in preview. You can control access and authentication types. Uh, privilege Identity Manager and Identity Protection. This is really what you get with Office 365 and Azure. There's a lot to it. Um, and then I mentioned Azure AD tiers. This is what you get with each of these tiers. Uh, P1, P2, and of course with BASIC. Um, the important note, once to note on P1 is um, the two-way sync, the self-service controls, conditional access, um, and the cloud app discovery, and then of course with P2, identity protection, privilege identity management. And I've got about two more minutes, so I'm going to cruise through these recommendations. But again, all the slides will be online. Uh, definitely rename the local administrator account and change the password because otherwise these attempts are going to get you. Um, limit the management protocol access for systems that don't need direct internet access. Um, and the Azure Security Center can monitor alerts. This is from the identity and access component. Um, definitely want to get MFA uh, deployed as widely as possible. The credential management is really tough in an environment that's always connected to the internet. And then the admin accounts, we definitely want MFA on all the admin accounts to help protect them. But ultimately, it comes down to the standard stuff, like least privilege, least access. Cloud admin workstations. We've got privileged admin workstations or access workstations in the corporate environment. We need to make sure that we're doing the same thing in the cloud environment, uh, or for the, managing the cloud environment. And then, of course, limiting this admin role membership and monitoring the group membership. PIM can help if you want to pay for P2 or if you already have it. And then, of course, with monitoring and alerting, all this stuff still matters. Uh, it's a little more confusing. It's a little more difficult to piece together in a cloud world because it's not as obvious. Uh, we know how the on-premise uh, on configuration of monitoring works. In the cloud environment, it takes more reading. It takes more research. And there's a bit of a learning curve. So in some way, it's a new paradigm. We're all figuring it out together. Um, the cloud resources are configured in different ways, and they change how these security uh, configurations are. They're not straightforward. There's some things we can do through the GUI, some things we can do through PowerShell. Um, but many of the items that apply to on-premises still apply in the cloud. So thank you very much for your time. That's been mine.